I'm so glad that our uh, six youth are going to camp. I uh, hope that next year there would be more than that because, uh, folks, some of the most exciting times uh, in, in my ministry over the years has been the time that uh, I was able to go to youth camp with uh, kids, uh, three, four hundred uh, high school uh, kids from the state of California. Uh, it, it's been a, a, a wonderful time, a joyful time. Uh, I also uh, uh, was excited about the time that my, my own kids were able to go to camp because I noticed that uh, they were completely different when they came home from camp. Uh, they had grown in the Lord and, and God had been speaking to them and, and, uh, and uh, laid some things upon their heart. And uh, one of the greatest times that we had at the church in Downey uh, came as a result of about 30 of our uh, youth going to camp. And, and folks, there was a revival that broke out. Uh, I mean, this is last part of July. And uh, the youth came back from from uh, camp and, and wanted to know uh, uh, if we could have church every night. And uh, uh, we had church every night for three weeks uh, there at Downey and uh, led by our youth. A, a revival broke out. We, we, uh, we baptized 36 people uh, as a result of that uh, three-week uh, meeting. Uh, it's, it's exciting when young people uh, get on fire. And so I'm excited about our youth. I'm excited about uh, the blessings that we're going to see uh, in, the, uh, in the days to come. Uh, uh, just pray all week long for our youth as they're at camp, that God would just simply uh, speak through their heart, open their eyes, and, uh, and uh, be filled with God's Spirit in such a way that when they, came, when they come back home uh, next Sunday, uh, uh, they would just simply set you guys on fire as well. Amen? Take your Bibles and turn with me to uh, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, we're going to be looking at a uh, passage of Scripture in the 20th chapter of Luke, beginning with verse 20. And uh, I want to say something before we, we reread this passage of Scripture. Uh, when uh, Brother Michael and I talked about uh, uh, responsibility and job description as, as being your associate pastor, uh, Brother Michael says, uh, I, I will not tell you what to preach. And I won't tell you what passage of Scripture uh, that you need to use. Uh, we'll let the Spirit lead you and guide you uh, uh, in this matter. But here a few weeks ago when he asked me to uh, preach on this particular Sunday morning because he's back uh, in Oklahoma, he said, I, I, I need to go back on what I said. Uh, I, I want you to preach from the Gospel of Luke, the 20th chapter, picking up where I will leave off the previous Sunday. Now the reason that Brother uh, Michael has asked me to do that is because he's been in the Gospel of Luke for what? almost a year, a little over a year, and he wants to kind of finish up with Luke by the end of August, okay? And, uh, and his plan right now, as he's looking at September and October, is a, another series of um, sermons, messages for us, dealing with hot topics that um, the church is facing today. And so he's talking about uh, uh, looking God's word about biblical marriage, uh, about homosexuality, about abortion, uh, what does the Bible say about uh, alcoholism and uh, the use of occasional drugs. Uh, these are some real uh, issues, folks, that, that the church is facing today. And so starting in September, Pastor Michael wants to begin a series of messages dealing with hot topics of the church today. And to do that, he feels that he needs to end up at the uh, end of uh, August uh, with the Gospel of Luke. And the only way that he can do that is for me to go ahead and, 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 and carry on that journey through the Gospel of Luke. And so we're going to be looking at this passage of Scripture in the 20th chapter, beginning with verse 20. Now, before we read this passage of Scripture, there are several things I, I think that we need to remember, uh, that we need to be aware of. First of all, we need to see where Jesus is at when he is sharing uh, uh, that which we're going to look at today. 
Now remember, uh, uh, first of uh, first Sunday of, of June, uh, Pastor Michael uh, has brought us uh, from Bethany uh, into Jerusalem. And you remember uh, the first Sunday of June, he talked about the triumphant entry of the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem and all the events that, that took place there. So we need to remember that Jesus is in Jerusalem and he is being... He is being attacked once again by the religious leaders there in Jerusalem. That's the first thing we need to remember. Secondly, I think we need to remember that the Gospel of Luke is divided basically into two timelines. And if we can can see this, it helps us to understand a little bit more of what we're going to be looking at, not only today, but also what Pastor Cooper has looked at last week and, and in the weeks to come. If you look at the Gospel of Luke, Luke can be divided into two timelines, beginning with chapter 1, verse 1, and running through chapter 19 to the middle part of 19, about verse 25, uh, uh, Luke deals with basically the entire 33 years of the life of Jesus. Chapter 1 and 2 deals with the birth of Christ Jesus. And by the way, uh, chapter 1 and 2 of the Gospel of Luke is the most detailed description of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where you deal with, with the manger scene, the, the wise men, the shepherds, and all of that that is connected with the nativity scene. And the reason that is true, beloved, is because Luke is not only a a physician by trade, but he's a historian as well. And Luke wants to make sure that we understand the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's, there's, there's two great chapters that deals in detail with the birth of Jesus. You know, Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And if you look in the first chapter of the book of Acts... Uh, which is a continuation, a sequel to, to the Gospel of Luke. Luke says, these things I write that you may know that your faith is good. This is the truth. These are the facts. Mark it down. Now, that's my words. Mark it down. Go to school on this. And the same thing is true in chapter 1 and 2. He gives us a detailed description of the birth of Jesus that we might know That which is truth concerning the birth of Christ. Chapter 3, he makes that transition from those early years to the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And and, and then he begins to share uh, from chapter 4 through chapter 19. The three years that Jesus spent in his public ministry. And then there at the middle part of chapter 19, he brings us to the triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. And from the middle part of chapter 19 through the end of the book, Jesus, uh, uh, Luke deals with the last eight days, basically, in the life of Jesus. Uh, that, That week that we call Holy Week. That week that begins with the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And that concludes with that glorious, wonderful day called Resurrection Sunday. And so for eight days from chapter 19 through the end of the book. Luke deals with all of the things that takes place in the life of Jesus in those eight days. Now also chapter 24 Deals with about three or four other events that takes place after the resurrection. uh, Before Jesus ascended back to the right hand of the Lord. And we need to uh, see that. And if we see that then we can understand the importance of chapter 19 through the end of the book. Jesus is being confronted by the religious leaders over and over and over and over and over again. Day after day after day after day. Leading up to that glorious time that Jesus observes the Passover feast with his disciples. He breaks the bread. He pours out the fills the cup. Gives it to the disciples and said, this is my body and my blood, which is broken and shed for you. And then Jesus goes to Calvary and he dies. Oh, what a dark day that was on Friday. (laughs) But praise God, Sunday was coming. 
And it came. And he rose victorious from the grave. And so the last couple of Sundays and, and today and, and over the rest of the Sundays of, of June and, and July and August, Pastor Cooper is going to be dealing with those eight days in the life of Jesus before he rose from the grave. Now with that in mind, look at what the scripture says, verse 20, chapter 20. Uh, They watched closely and sent spies who pretended to be righteous. By the way, who are uh, described in this word they? The religious leaders. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the the Herodians, the political group called the Herodians. uh, All of those individuals who had been attacking Jesus and trying to trick Jesus up for about three years. They were there in Jerusalem... And, uh, and, and they sent spies to talk to Jesus. This is probably Monday afternoon. Jesus came into Jerusalem on Sunday, the triumphant entry. Now they're attacking Jesus as the pastor was sharing uh, last week and the week before. And, and here they uh, sent spies to ask Jesus uh, a question. But notice what it says. They watched closely, the the, the religious leaders watched closely and sent spies who pretended to be righteous. Mark that down. They pretended to be righteous. So they could catch him, that is Jesus, in what he said. To hand him over to the governor's rule and authority. They questioned him. Rabbi, we know that you speak and teach correctly and you don't show partiality. But teach truthfully the way of God. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar? But detecting their craftiness, he said to them, Show me a Daenerys, that is a coin. Uh, Whose image and inscription does it have? Caesar's, they said. Well then, he told them, Give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. They were not... Uh, able to catch him in what he said in public, and being amazed at his answer, they, uh, by the way, this is my word, also became silent. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. There's three things that I would like for us to notice today in this passage of Scripture. Uh, one one is, the, is the fact that the religious leaders sent these counterfeit individuals, these these inquirers, to bait Jesus, to trap Jesus, to trick Jesus into saying something that that they could turn him over to the governor of the land and and let the Roman Empire put him to death. Uh, That's interesting to me. For you see, if you look back in chapter 19 uh, and the first part of chapter 20... Uh, the religious leaders had just been trounced. I mean, they had been whipped by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, They had come to him. They had tried to trick him. They had tried to bait him into uh, uh, saying something that the Roman Empire could could use against him and and, uh, and charge him with. And, 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 And this had been going on for some time. And Jesus literally whipped them. I mean, he spanked them spiritually. Uh, <laughs> and so they sent substitutes to uh, try to bait Jesus and trick Jesus into uh, saying something that they could use uh, uh, in the court system. Uh, and these spies were not really dedicated to what they thought that they believed or what they said that they believed, but, but they, they were only... Uh, desire to satisfy the religious leaders of that time, hoping that Jesus would say something to them. Let's just camp out here for just a moment. For you see, beloved, this is the same thing that had been going on for the three years in the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in all honesty, folks, I I believe it's been something that's been going on since the beginning of time. Uh, remember what uh, the preacher of Ecclesiastes said, Solomon? Uh, he, he used two or three phrases there in the book of Ecclesiastes that kind of jumps out at you. Uh, one of them is vanity of vanities. <laughs> this too is vanity. Uh, a, a, another phrase he uses is, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. 
You, have, do you remember that? As you read through Ecclesiastes, nothing new. There's nothing new. The same thing goes around and around and around and around. And so it is in our society today. Folks, there's nothing new today. Uh, Satan is still trying to do the same thing in your life and my life as he has done through the, uh, uh, be, uh, from, from, the, from the beginning of time. Uh, he started with Adam and Eve. Uh, the Bible says that God created Adam, then he made Eve. He placed them in the garden of, of, uh, of Eden there. And he, and he said to Adam, he said, of all that you see, you can, you can enjoy and you can take pleasure in. But this one fruit of this one tree, don't even touch. And remember what happens. The Bible says that not long after God did that, another being came on the scene, Satan. And, 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 and Satan comes to Adam. Now, now listen, fellas. Don't try to tell me that it was Eve that sinned. It was Adam that sinned because it was Adam's responsibility. Hmm. Ladies, I thought you would say amen on that one. Uh, but, but remember, Satan comes to, to Adam and, 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 uh, and basically says God's a liar. <laughs> Uh, no, nothing's going to happen. He, he knows that when you take of this one fruit, uh, your eyes will be open and you will become like a god. Uh-uh. That's false. It's not true. And, and then remember, that God comes uh, after Adam and, and Eve sinned and, and he comes in the coolness of the evening and, and to have fellowship with Adam and Eve again. And, 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 uh, and where is Adam and Eve? They're hiding from God. <laughs> and, 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 and in that conversation, he, 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 uh, he, he asks the question, uh, who did this? Uh, why did you do it? Uh, and, and I suggest to you, beloved, that Adam even tried to blame God for this. Because what did Adam say? It was that woman you gave me. Look it up, folks. Go back into the book of Genesis. Study the book of Genesis. Adam was blaming God. Uh, the problem is, you gave me this woman. It's your fault. And my, 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 my belief is, beloved, that even from that very moment to this very moment today, Satan is still trying to trick us up, blaming God for the things that you and I do. Jesus started his public ministry, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of his day tried to trick him up. Notice what these spies said when they came to Jesus. They came to him and said, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you speak and teach how? Correctly. <laughs> uh, but, watch it now. But, will you truthfully tell us about God did, did you see that? Do you see that, folks? They came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, we know that you're a great rabbi, you're a great teacher, and you teach the truth, but will you tell us truthfully about who God is and about the authority that you have to do the things that you do? <sighs> folks, that's, that's what's happening in our world today. We have a lot of people who, who, who says, I, I want to know who or, or what truth is. Uh, I wish that God would tell us the truth. I've got news for you folks. God has always told us the truth. Uh, some of you young people are, 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 are finishing up with your high school years and you're going to be going off to college and there's others here that are in college. And, and, I, and I, hear, I hear young people say, well, I want to go and I want to be enlightened with truth. Folks, here's the truth. If you want to know what truth is, who truth is, look at the Word of God. Because what did Jesus say? Jesus says, I am the way 
and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, I went to a, a state university uh, for part of my education. And, 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 and my professor in sciences told me that I had to answer the questions according to the way she was teaching if I wanted to pass the grade, I passed the course. And I said, I can't tell you that I believe that all life came from a little RNA uh, and DNA getting together and forming a first cell billions of years ago. Uh, we were in a, in, a, in a class of about 300 in this lecture hall, and, and I kept raising my hand. Uh, ra- Finally, Dr. Vail says, yes, Mr. Reed, what do you want? I said, how can that be? <laughs> and I, I'm not pulling your leg, folks. She looked at me and she said, Mr. Reed, there are certain things you just simply have to accept. <laughs> Amen. It is easier for me to believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And not only do I believe that, folks, I believe that God keeps everything together. Do you know what Paul said? Paul says that it is uh, Christ who created all things, and he created all things for him, and without him nothing is created, and he holds all things together. The secret, folks, to all of this is laminate. (laughs) You say, preacher, what in the world are you talking about? Laminate. (sighs) What holds your chromosomes and your molecules together? Do you know? It is something called laminate that can be discovered Underneath an electronic microscope. Oh, I wish I had a picture of it here. I I don't. This is off the cuff. I didn't even think about this until right now. Uh, 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 This glue that holds all things together looks like a crooked cross. (laughs) I'm not making this up, folks. I'm not making it up. They say that there is a glue, this laminate that holds things together. And it looks like a crooked cross. I suggest to you folks, God made all things and he holds all things together. That's truth. But our our world is trying to challenge God. And trying to convince us that God is not true and God is not real. I was just talking to a, my neighbor across the street's uh, uh, a daughter and son-in-law. And, and, and the subject came up about abortion. And the, and, and, and the couple told me, made this statement. Abortion ends Pregnancy. I said, hogwash. The only thing that ends pregnancy is birth. Hey, I'm, I'm dead serious, folks. The, the only, ladies, the only thing that will end your pregnancy is a birth of a child. Whether it's a live birth or a still birth, a dead birth. Uh, Birth ends pregnancy. Do you know what abortion does? It kills a human being. You see, these these spies came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, we we know that you teach the truth. We, 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 We know you teach correctly. But will you speak truthfully concerning God? Folks, if Jesus teaches the truth correctly, that settles the issue. And the same thing is true in your life and my life today. Jesus speaks the truth. The Bible speaks the truth. God speaks the truth. Why do we want to look elsewhere for the truth? 
when God and Christ Jesus, the Son of God, is truth. Second thing I want you to notice there is that Jesus saw through this whole deception by, by these spies. Um, uh, um, if they didn't recognize him, uh, Jesus truly recognized them. <laughs> Uh, uh, they came and said, teacher, we, we know that you're a, 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 you, you teach correctly, but tell us uh, truthfully about God. And, 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 and Jesus knew that that was not the real issue. The real issue, folks, was authority. It goes back to verses 1 through 8 in the 20th chapter of, of Luke. What were the religious leaders asking Jesus to do? They were asking him in verses 1 through 80, uh, 1 through 8 to, to uh, 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 give them the reason that Jesus was saying the things that he was saying. By what authority do you say these things? By what authority do you th- do these things? Now, what were, what were some of the things that, that Jesus was saying? Well, Jesus talked, and, and talked to the Pharisees and said, you are whitewashing everything. <laughs> You know what the Pharisees were teaching? Uh, They were not only teaching that you have to obey the law of Moses, but you also had to obey man-made laws as well. And they were very uh, proud for the fact that they had kept the law. Uh, Ladies, how many of you looked at yourself in the mirror this morning before you came to church? Sinful, sinful individuals. Because under the Pharisaic law, you could not look at yourself in the mirror before, on the Sabbath day. Or ladies, you would, became, you would become vain. Oh, how beautiful I am. How wonderful I look. Oh, oh, there's a gray hair. I mean... Uh, fellas, you could not come to church uh, if you were a Jew on the Sabbath day carrying your cane. You know why? Because if you came to church or to the synagogue or or the temple on, on the Sabbath day, you may drag your cane in the dirt and therefore you would be plowing the field. And these were the 2,000 plus laws that the Pharisees had created. And they were very proud of the fact that they kept the law. And they, and they said things like this. Oh God, I am so grateful that I am better than Peter over there. <laughs> Arrogant individuals. And Jesus had trounced them and, and, and spanked them for that kind of of religion and and he said you are whitewashing everything he 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 challenged the sadducees who were scribes in a certain a sense and he he chastised them for the, what they were doing uh he, he, here is here is the the attempt by these So-called religious individuals who came to Jesus and said, We know that you teach the truth, but speak to us truthfully about God. And Jesus saw beyond their uh, their deception and, and knew what the issue was. And the issue was, by what authority are you doing these things? And beloved, the same thing is true in our lives today. Whether we want to admit it or not, God knows our heart. He knows what we're thinking right now. He knows our attitude right now. And he knows if our relationship with him is a good relationship right now. Now, third thing I want you to notice is that Jesus addressed the issue of authority correctly. That was the real issue. 
by what authority do you do these things? And when these spies came to him and said, uh, do we have to pay our taxes? (laughs) Do we have to pay our taxes to the Roman government? Jesus said, uh, show me a coin. And they showed him a coin. And the coin had had the image uh, of the emperor on the Daenerys, on the coin. And there was a little inscription underneath that talked about the, the, the authority of the Roman government. That the Daenerys was a, a, a issued by the authority of the Roman government. And then Jesus said, give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and unto the God the things that are God. Now, there are all kinds of individuals who have tried to give an explanation of what this whole thing is all about. I don't have time to give you all of those. In fact, one, 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 one uh, school of thought says, well, Jesus simply said this because he was clever. And he wanted to, to teach them that he was, uh, he was uh, uh, more clever than, than the religious leaders. <laughs> Folks, if, that is the, if that's what you believe, your, your faith is pretty shallow. Because it's more than that. What Jesus is simply saying is this. There's an image of the emperor... And the inscription of the government on the coin. And so you have to pay your taxes. You just have to do it. And, and, and can I say right now, folks, you and I still have to obey the laws of the land. We may not like the laws. But you don't have a right to go out there and do whatever you want to do. You have to obey the laws of the land. But what Jesus is saying here is more important than all of that is that you need to obey the rules of the kingdom of God. You are to give to God that which belongs to him. And so the question is simply this this morning, folks, is whose image do you bear? Who, whose inscription is written upon your heart? Who, who do you belong to? I stand amazed in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary willingly and he died for me willingly. That I might have life and have it more abundantly. Folks, I really believe that if all of you were absolutely perfect and you're not. (laughs) I I, I believe if if all of you have have never, 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 never sinned and, and will never sin. And all the people in the entire world who has lived and who are alive today are perfect and have never sinned. And Kenneth Reed stands as the only sinner condemned unclean. Jesus still would have died for me. I'm I'm not my own, folks. I am purchased with a price. Jesus died for me. That I might have life. And that I might have it more abundantly. And so I belong to him. He has redeemed me. How many of you are old enough to remember The blue chip and the green stamp stores. Okay. For those of you who don't remember that because you're not old enough. You would go to a grocery store, a gas station or something. And you would buy your product, you know, that you wanted. And they would give you blue chip stamps. And green chip stamps. Okay. And you would lick these stamps and put them in a book. And after you have 4,000 books full of stamps, you could take them and buy a $19 toaster at the Redemption Center. That was the big sign over. 
Blue Chip Stamp Redemption Center. Folks, I believe that there should be something on sign, uh, a sign on every church, you know, Redemption Center. <laughs> Because redemption means to be purchased, to buy back. And beloved, my Lord Jesus Christ died upon the cross of Calvary for me and he bought me with his blood. I am not my own. I belong to him. And because I belong to him, I need to bear his image. And I need to have the inscription written across my heart. Saved, redeemed, forgiven, a child of the Almighty God. You see, the spies came to Jesus to satisfy the desire of the religious leaders who had been trounced by Jesus for days and weeks and years before. Trying to trick Jesus up. By asking the question, is it lawful to pay taxes to the Roman government? Jesus said, give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. But most important than that, give to God that which belongs to him. And the bottom line is simply this. Whose image? Whose inscription is on your heart and in your life? My wife used to work uh, for Bank of America. Oh, I shouldn't say that. She worked for a large bank of America. <laughs> and, 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 and this particular bank <laughs> kind of went sterile, you know, on everything and, and told all of the officers, uh, don't have pictures of your family and your husband or your wife or you know every everything that would make it warm i mean when they came up when people came up to the to the desk they wanted the uh, uh, bank officials to keep it sterile keep it business like yeah, you know, don't don't appear to be warm take care of business and so they had to remove all the Good little things that, you know, kids have made. You know, vacation Bible school. and Take down all of the pictures. Well, one day, Mary, who was an officer of the bank, was behind her desk. And a woman came up. And Mary invited her over there to her, to her table. And stood up and shook hands with her. And, and, um, and asked the question, uh, how, how, how can I help you today? The woman in a very soft voice with tears beginning to come down her uh, cheek said, You're a Christian, aren't you? Well, Mary, because of her Christian faith, cannot denounce it. She said with a soft voice, Yes, I am. And the woman says, I just need to talk to another Christian today. And they talked for a few moments. And there was other people coming up and sitting in the seats. And Mary knew that they needed to come and talk about bank business, most likely. But she didn't want to dismiss this woman without some kind of a prayer. And with her eyes opened. (laughs) You can pray with your eyes open, okay? That's the only way to drive on California streets is with your eyes open and pray. Uh, she, she asked God, will you please be with my newfound sister? Be the pillar that she needs for you to be today. Be her strength. Be her help. Reveal yourself to her and your love for us as your children. Amen. Woman got up. She said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Walked away. 
Now, folks, Mary could have lost her job under the, under the conditions of the bank at that time. But she didn't. But my question is, how in the world did this woman know that Mary was a Christian? There was no big sign across her, her chest that said, I am a Christian, come to me. She didn't have a, a big crown on her head that says, I'm a royal child of God. But I suggest to you, there was something in her character. There was something in her countenance that said, I'm a child of God. Whose image are you bearing today? What inscription is on your heart today? Over there in the book of Acts, the 11th chapter, we find that the Christians were first called Christians at Antioch because they were what? Christ-like. Now, I suggest to you folks that the believers did not call themselves Christians. They, they did not have a business meeting and say, okay, I think we need to form a new word today. And I think we need to call ourselves Christians today. And we'll make it to mean Christ-like. Now, they didn't do that. But as the people went out into the streets of Antioch, the non-believers noticed something different in the life of these believers And they were like Christ. And so they coined the phrase Christian. Jesus here was approached by individuals who seemed to be righteous. To be honest. And they said, Lord uh, or Rabbi, we know that you teach correctly. But will you teach us truthfully? About God. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He saw beyond their pretense. And the issue was authority. And Jesus said. Whose image are you bearing? Whose inscription of authority. Is on your heart. And on your life. And my question to you and to me in closing this morning is simply this. Whose image? Whose inscription is on our heart? And do people see Jesus in us day by day?